Um, thanks for joining us. We are going to get started here. Um, my name is Scott Siebel. I'm the Outreach Director here at Fairvote. Uh, with me is uh, Deb Otis. You want to introduce yourself, Deb? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. My name is Deb. I am a Senior Research Analyst at Fairvote. Fantastic. And we're going to take uh, um, about an hour uh, to go through our RCV presentation. What is ranked choice voting? Um, it's basically a one on one. And uh, make sure to put your any comments or questions you have in the uh, uh, chat uh, and in the Q&A for all the panelists so we can see those. I'll go through my presentation about what is retrace voting. Uh, Deb will go through hers uh, a little bit more in depth uh, on, on retrace voting, and then we can answer your questions uh, near the end. So we'll hopefully have a, about a good 20 minutes or so to answer all of your questions. So without further ado, let me share my screen and uh, start um, with the presentation. Fantastic. So welcome everyone. So like I said, I'm Scott, this is Deb. Uh, what we're gonna be covering today, uh, problems uh, of our current electoral system uh, our solution, uh, which is ranked choice voting, and how you can help. So I'm going to go through a little bit uh, of that. It should take about 15 minutes, and then Deb's going to go through a little bit uh, more on her end. So before we really get in depth about what is ranked choice voting and, 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 and talk about that for a bit, I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, the problems with our current system, um, kind of why we want to move to ranked choice voting or why people would organizations and and uh and, and municipalities want to move to ranked choice voting um because of some of the problems that occur in our system so uh, our current system uh winner take all some people call it single choice plurality some people call first past the post uh there's a lot of uh, uh different uh, names for it but it's basically um what you kind of see here, a lot of people running, you can choose one. Now there's a lot of problems with that system. There's vote splitting and strategic voting. Um, there's limited voter choice. I'm gonna talk about that in a second as well. Uh, we often get non-majority winners in uh, the current system and that leads to an unrepresentative democracy. Um, in today's uh, system, we see a lot of polarization, uh, partisan polarization, uh, and a lot of negative campaigning. So that there's a lot of problems with our, our current system about how we elect candidates, how we elect uh, our representatives. But those are, are, are four of the, of the problems that um, we see uh, in our current system. And I'll talk a little bit about how ranked choice voting might affect and impact um, those four problems. But for the first one, voting, vote splitting and, and strategic voting. So um, how many of you guys out there have, have felt like you've ever had to vote for the lesser of two evils? Um, uh, you know, you have to go into the voting booth and say, okay, well, I don't really love this person. I really don't like this person. So I'm gonna have to choose between the lesser of two evils. Um, and you often wish you could vote for a candidate that actually represents your views but you fear doing so would help elect someone you actively oppose. Um, that's the thought process that we currently have um, through strategic voting. People have to think about, I really like this candidate, but I don't know if they're gonna actually win and I don't wanna elect somebody I really hate, so who should I exactly vote for? And that's kind of what we uh, are, are taught now, what we internalize and, and that's a lot of the strategic thinking strategic voting that, that we come out with. And does any of you guys wish we had more candidates uh, who could run without fear of splitting the vote among like-minded candidates? Um, I do, and as the uh, graphic there uh, have seen, you can get a, when a lot of people run, when you know more than two people run, you can often have candidates who are similar, uh, whether ideologically similar or you know, a couple Two or two or three or more progressives, or two or three more conservatives, 
or demographically uh, similar, like to, uh, Af to folks in the African-American community or Asian-American community, uh, both run and split the votes from that community and somebody else wins uh, with less than 50% of the vote, um, oftentimes here in that graphic, less than 20% of the vote. So that often happens in our current uh, system and that's a problem. Another problem is limited voter choice. So you ever wish you had more and better choices on the ballot? And do you wish you could express your preferences a little bit more fully? Um, and, and really do not feel represented by the choices to be your representative. Oftentimes, um, we might get only two choices on the ballot. You have to vote for one person or the other. And, and, and as we talk about later in, in a ranked choice voting election, that is uh, not necessary to limit your choices. And oftentimes it's either uh, a political party or other folks who, um, who limit the choices uh, of the candidates that voters uh, have to choose uh, because they wanna say, well, it's, it's not your turn. Or just like we talked about before on, on splitting the vote, they don't wanna have two progressives in the race or they don't wanna have two uh, conservatives in the race or they don't have, wanna have two folks from the African-American community in the race. So the uh, political party or, or whoever else will limit the choices and say, no, you shouldn't run this time. Um, you, you, you wait your turn. So it limits the choices um, that we see out there. Another problem with our, our current system is we have non-majority winners. Uh, when uh, more than two candidates are on the ballot, the winner can get less than a majority of support. Um, so by majority support, you know, over 50% of the vote uh, when you are electing one person. So when, when that happens, and it continuously happens from uh, our representatives to our governors, to our senators, to our city council members, to our mayors, when it happens all over across the country, you get a less uh, representative democracy uh, uh, for you know, the people. So as you, as you can see that an example, I'm sure everyone uh, can come up with their own examples of someone winning with less than 50% of the vote, uh, whether that's, um, it's famously happened quite a few times in the presidential election in certain states, uh, whether uh, my first election that I was able to uh, uh, vote in was 2000. Um, so that was Bush v. Gore and famously in, in um, Florida and other folk, other places, um, whether it's Ralph Nader in 2000 or it's been other uh, third parties uh, uh, since then, uh, all, the winner didn't get a majority of support. So often we, we, we see that and that's something ranked choice voting can fix. Um, one of the last things that's a problem with our system that I wanna talk about, is kind of our political incentives. It's incentivizing towards polarization and negative campaigns. So currently in our single choice plurality elections, winner candidates don't need, they would like obviously, but they don't need a majority support to win. So they can simply rely on their base, on their you know, base of support to get their folks out. And they don't need to reach out to talk to all voters. They don't need to reach out to talk to majority of voters to win. And so that can lead to polarization, partisan polarization. It can lead to negative campaigning. When I only need my strong few voters to come out and win, then I'll really rile up that base of support. And what that could mean would be negative campaigning. I could um, you know, uh, trash my opponent all I want and nothing will, that won't hurt me because I'm not trying to get a majority of support. All I really need is really that energized base of support that cares about me. So that leads to negative campaigning, it leads to polarization, and it leads to a politics that really has stopped working for a lot of a lot of people in this country. What is the solution? Um, so that's a lot of problems that I that I laid out a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the solution to a lot of those problems are. And as you can see, uh, why you signed up for this? It's ranked choice voting is 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 part of the solution. So I will say it's not the only solution to fix all of our problems but it's gonna be a really good, simple, 
uh, straightforward solution that'll fix a lot of these, these issues. So uh, before I talk a little bit more about all that stuff, uh, let me just show you a quick video that kind of explains it a little bit better. I can. Politics is tearing us apart because elections aren't working for most of us. Here's why. In the US, each of us can vote for the candidate we like the most. But whenever more than two candidates are running to win one seat, it's possible for both voters to hate whoever wins. Because of the split vote, politicians can ignore the will of most voters and still win. Ranked choice voting gives you the freedom to select a backup choice to prevent that from happening. Let's say you decide what to eat for dinner tonight. Voters select their favorite dish, but also have the option to choose backup dishes. If one voter sees more than half the votes, it wins, just like in any other election. But let's get to dessert, where the competition is more fierce. What if no ice cream flavor has more than 50% of the vote? Under a normal race, vanilla would win, even though a majority of voters didn't pick it. With ranked choice voting, the flavor with the fewest votes is eliminated, and voters who chose that flavor as number one will have their votes count for their next choice. Everyone gets a seat. No one wastes their vote, and the winner is the flavor and the largest number of people agreed upon. That's ranked choice voting. It's as easy as one, two, three. You get more voice and more choice, and that makes elections better for all of us. Fantastic. So that's a little bit um, why ranked choice voting would be a better system. Um, whoops. Um, Politics is tearing us apart. Oh, I did that. Um, so that's why uh, ranked choice voting would be, uh, talks a little bit about ranked choice voting and, and, and what, uh, let me exit full screen here. There we go. Um, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about obviously what ranked choice voting is. You saw there, it's a very simple uh, change to our ballot. Um, instead of voting for one candidate, you rank your candidates in order of preference, uh, one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, that's what a ranked choice voting ballot would look like. Um, and just like any election, if you're electing one candidate, um, if candidates get uh, over 50% of the first choice, first choices, they win. If not, um, the candidate with the least amount of uh, first choices gets eliminated and their votes go to the second, second choice. And then you repeat the process until anyone gets over 50% of the vote. So in this uh, scenario, rank your favorite candy. Uh, M&M's would be first, Snickers second, Star Skittles third, Starburst fourth. I'm a big fan of M&M's myself. So that's what a, a, a ranked choice ballot would look like to the voter. It's really simple, it's really easy. And Deb will talk a little bit more about how simple and easy it is and how people actually understand how to rank their choices um, just like anything else. Now this would be how it works, how's the counting work? So. Like I said, if anyone, they, they count all first choices. If your first choice gets over 50% of the vote, you win, just like any other elections, very simple. Uh, if your first if, if nobody gets over 50% of the vote, like here, uh, then uh, they look to eliminate the last, uh, the, the candidate with the least amount of first choice votes um, and take their first choice votes to their next choice votes. So let's see how that works in the second round, right there. So does anyone have over 50% of the vote yet? Not quite, we're almost there. So uh, we have to do one more round uh, to determine the winner. And boom, now we have a winner. So uh, with ranked choice voting, it, it, it makes sure that the first candidate, the candidate that wins um, ends up with a broad, uh, much more broad support um, than without ranked choice voting. So lastly, I'm gonna go over this a little bit. And then um, by the way, please, uh, I see some comments and some questions in the, uh, in the chat, please keep, uh, keep those coming. So we'll answer those here in a little bit. 
but some of the benefits of ranked choice voting. So we, we talked about more choice. Um, it eliminates the spoiler effect. Um, so the spoiler effect being uh, two similar candidates uh, running in the same race. Uh, they split the vote between that community and then um, it spoils their campaign for the, the spoils their vote and somebody else ends up winning. Um, with ranked choice voting, we eliminate that. Um, so uh, two people that are similar backgrounds or similar demographics or similar ideologies can run, can feel free to all run the same uh, ranked choice voting election. And they can say to their constituents, vote for me first. If you don't, uh, if I don't win, then I really want this other candidate uh, that is very like me uh, to win. So we've actually seen that in a few different races uh, where uh, candidates will team up and say, uh, vote for me, number one, vote for so-and-so, number two. It happened in, the, in Maine, uh, where ranked choice voting was used up there uh, for their primaries and uh, their federal races. So we saw that happening in Maine. We've, we saw it happening in uh, San Francisco in the mayoral race where a couple of candidates came together and said, rank for me number one, rank my opponent uh, normally number two. Um, so uh, that kind of happens in, in ranked choice voting elections. It eliminates the spoiler effect. And because of that, we see more civil campaigns. So we see a lot more uh, campaigns that uh, try to reach beyond their base and say, vote for uh, me number one, but if, you, if, if, if you're if you supporting somebody else, that's okay. I, I really wanna uh, do what that person uh, says on the environment or on jobs or on taxes or whatever. So really rank me number two. So that's, that's why the civil campaigning uh, really, really works. And um, in fact, in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, when they did their first ranked choice voting election, uh, not a couple of years ago for, for mayor, there was actually some stories out there about why are these candidates so nice to each other, um, which is um, uh, surprising uh, because we don't really see those stories a lot in our, in our, in our politics nowadays. And it was because all of the, the, the folks who are running for mayor were trying to get second and third choice votes. So they were being very civil to each other. Uh, last couple of things, we get to a majority winner, uh, like we talked about. It's, uh, you know, someone can't win with now 30, 40% of the vote. They need to reach beyond their base and get uh, a majority of, of RCV support. And lastly, um, it changes the political incentives and, and it, it, it stops the political incentive to just care about your own base, and your own support and, and, and be very negative to everybody else. And it, it, changes the game of politics and the change of the game of, of politicians when they need to uh, gather coalitions together. They need to reach beyond their base. They need to reach across the aisle. They need to reach to, to a, a broader uh, swath of the public. And it really changes their incentives to really listen to and hear the issues that are facing all of the voters and all of the people uh, in their district and not just uh, a, a, a smaller swath of a smaller swath. So that's why we support ranked choice voting. A um, couple other things quickly. Uh, if you wanna support ranked choice voting, um, you can get involved locally. Um, so there's a state-based coalition group near you. Um, you go to fairvote.org slash state-based coalition groups or fairvote.org slash get involved. Um, and you can see your state-based coalition partner group possibly there. And if it's not, please let us know. And if we can't connect you to other folks, we'd love to have you get started on creating another one. Uh, the other way to get involved, besides locally, you can get involved from anywhere. So there's a, a rankit.vote. Uh, and this is an interesting online, easy way to do ranked choice voting. Uh, from you know social media, you can put it on your Twitters and your Facebooks and your Instagrams and all and TikToks and whatever you want to do out there. You can put it on and 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 have people uh, understand how how ranking works. And for example, I just did uh, a best movie villain. Uh, if you click that, you go to rankit.vote and see. 
uh, who you want as your best movie villain. I'm, uh, I'll go with Joker, uh, Scar, uh, Thanos, uh, Voldemort, um, Hannibal Lecter, and Darth Vader. And then you can decide, eh, kind of like, okay, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll move Thanos to second. Here we go. And you can move around whoever you want here um, and then submit your vote. So what that looks like on a results end is uh, I just did this. If, if, you, if you guys want to do it, please feel free to. Uh, but uh, the Joker wins with 50% of the vote, 54% of the vote. And you can see the round by round counts of, of how it works there with, with each of the lower candidates getting eliminated and their second choice is going uh, to other candidates. Now we got the Joker, Thanos and Voldemort. And then, oh, the Joker wins at a comeback uh, victory at the end there. So it, it's if you go to rank at that vote, you can create your own poll. It's a fun, easy way to show your community and your, your friends, family, just how rank choice voting works. Um, so that um, with that, I'm gonna throw it over to Deb um, now, uh, we'll stop sharing. Um, so Dav, I'm going to throw it over to you. And uh, before we get into that, again, I'll just do one more plug to throw in your questions and answers at the end uh, that we can uh, put in the chat and through, through in the Q&A. So Deb and I can answer your uh, probably more intricate, detailed questions uh, than we're going over. Uh, at the end. So uh, Deb, take it away. Thanks so much, Scott, and thanks to everyone for being here. So my role at FairVote is a research analyst, and what this means is that I often dig into the data coming out of ranked choice voting elections. And so for my portion of this presentation today, I want to talk about how ranked choice voting is working in practice. Uh, I am sharing my screen here. I have some slides as well. So with ranked choice voting, we have a lot of data to look at as this system has been in use around the world for over 100 years in countries like Australia and Ireland, and also in more than 20 states in the US are using it in at least some cities. And so when we look at election data, we often ask questions like, do voters like using this system? Uh, are, are we electing consensus winners? Like Scott says that this system should be doing. Uh, how is this impacting representation for underrepresented groups? And then lastly, I want to I'll do a little case study on how this works in presidential primaries because we had four states using it in presidential primaries this uh, last year. So let's jump right in. As I said, ranked choice voting has already been used uh, in elections in over 20 states as well as countries around the world. One of my favorite things about being a researcher in the RCV world is that there is a lot of data to look at. We don't have to talk about the hypotheticals of how ranked choice voting might work. We can look at how it actually does work and how it has changed elections in practice. So in addition to all of these areas that already use ranked choice voting, momentum is growing. Uh, ranked choice is on a hot streak. Uh, in 2020, seven ballot questions uh, were won uh, by our local allies across the country. So one of these was a new statewide implementation. That's the state of Alaska and then six cities in the US, including one at the bottom of the list there is Portland, Maine. Portland was already using ranked choice for some offices and the voters voted to expand it to use it even more. So that's an early indication right there that once voters have used this system, they tend to like it a lot. Let's dig a little bit deeper into that point. We typically see exit polls from places that have switched to ranked choice voting and we're seeing really strong results that voters over 70% typically are saying that they like ranked choice voting or that they prefer it to the prior method. Another metric we look at is whether voters are using the rankings. I, I saw a couple of questions go by in the chat, like do I have to rank all of the candidates or what happens if I rank only one? Ranking is always optional. You can rank as many or as few as you want. If you want to go vote the way you always have with just choose one, you are welcome to do so, but we are seeing most voters when given the option to rank, 
they choose to do so. The 68%, that's the, that's the median amount of voters who rank multiple candidates in RCV races. So when we see voters clearly wanting to take advantage of this opportunity to rank candidates, it's a no brainer that we should pass ranked choice voting in more places and allow them to do so. Lastly here, we look at whether voters understand ranked choice voting. We sometimes hear questions about, will this be too complex? I think I saw a question like that go by in the chat earlier. And the answer is, we, we look at this from two different, two, two different directions. One is, what are voters saying in exit polls? They say they understand it, and they say it is simple to use. We also look at the actual numbers. We can examine the ballot data and determine how many ballot errors are occurring, how many voters are making a mistake on their ballot. And we see that that ballot error rate is consistently low across the board, and it's on par with the error rate from our, our uh, current plurality elections. So voters are saying they understand it, and then they're, they're demonstrating it on the ballot by casting effective ballots with extremely low error rate. So it's great news for voter support and voter understanding for RCV. Next up, let's talk about the consensus winners that we typically get from ranked choice elections. Scott already demonstrated in his portion that ranked choice voting aims to identify a majority winner, meaning someone with more than 50% support. But in practice, it goes far beyond that. We, we look at a measure uh, of how many voters rank a particular candidate in their top three choices as a measure of consensus support. You know, maybe this candidate is not someone's first choice, but the voter still supports them enough to put them in their top three rankings. And so when we look at that metric, we're seeing that ranked choice winners typically have that level of consensus from 68% of voters. So we're getting consensus from way beyond just that 50% majority that we think is so crucial. So this is great news. When we elect someone with ranked choice voting, that person takes office with a strong mandate from voters, having built consensus for their policies and their platform. Next up, let's talk about representation. There is a lot of great diversity in the United States, but many of us are aware that that diversity is not always reflected in our elected officials. And ranked choice voting can help change that. Uh, over the last decade, women have won almost half of municipal level ranked choice elections. We're also seeing strong benefits for people of color uh, ranked choice voting has been shown to lead to more candidates of color running, so more choices on the ballot, and also more winning. Uh, so on my next slide, I want to dig deeper into that point there. So I'm going to show a big old chart, and uh, I'll walk you through it here. This chart aims to break down different types of districts and, and show that we're seeing these gains for people of color winning office more often in ranked choice voting, regardless of what type of district it is. We, of course, have to acknowledge that Districts are built differently. Demographics vary and voter behavior varies. So this chart breaks it down into three types. First up, on the far left, districts that are majority white, we see the, um, the number of people of color elected before RCV in blue, followed by after RCV in purple. So we're seeing a jump there. The overall number is still pretty low. Now let's look over into the middle category. This is uh, what we call minority majority districts, but where white voters are still the largest group in the district, even though they are less than 50%. So this, the, you know, this is a, a, a district with a lot of diversity here. And once again, we are seeing a big jump in districts with that sort of demographic makeup. Candidates of color are seeing strong gains after those cities implement ranked choice voting. Finally, the columns on the far right, uh, majority minority districts where white voters are not the largest group. There is at least one other group where there are more voters. Uh, and in these, once again, as we expect, even before ranked choice voting, districts like that were electing uh, plenty of candidates of color, but even in those districts, we see a bump. So I think this is a useful way to look at this, to break it down by different types of districts and show that we are seeing these gains across the board. So ranked choice voting has been demonstrated with evidence to improve representation for people of color and for women. So that's something that I think we can all get behind. Next up, I want to do a little case study here on ranked choice voting in presidential primaries. Uh, four states used RCV last year for their democratic primaries for their entire primary. 
and a fifth state, Nevada, used it just for early voters. And so this means we've been talking about wanting RCV in presidential primaries for a long time, and now we've seen it and it, the experiment worked really well. So we are excited to expand this further for the next cycle. Uh, let's talk about why RCV is so important in presidential primaries. It's good for the party because it broadens coalitions and it strengthens the party and helps ensure that a party sends a, uh, strong, a strong nominee into the general election to put their best foot forward into the November election. Uh, this is better for candidates. Candidates should not have to worry about splitting the vote between other like-minded candidates. In our presidential primaries, we often see really crowded fields uh, for a party that does not have an incumbent running, like this past year for the Democrats and four years ago for the Republicans. And for a lot of us, if you don't live in one of the early primary states, you might be excited to see all of that diversity, so many different candidates running, but most of them get forced out before most states even have a chance to vote. So ranked choice voting can, can open that up, let these candidates compete without worrying that they might spoil the election for a candidate who's similar to them. And lastly, of course, this is better for voters because we get the freedom to rank our choices. I find it simpler to rank choices in a crowded field than to pick just one. If you have to pick one, you have to do this math. Do I vote for my favorite candidate or do I vote for the candidate who has the best chance of beating the candidate who I don't like so much? With ranked choice voting, I don't have to do that math. I can walk in and rank my honest preferences. So great for voters. Let's look at how, uh, how it works for preventing wasted votes. Uh, at Fair Vote, we talk about this measure of wasted votes. And this means votes that were cast for a candidate who had already dropped out prior to election day. In 2020, we saw, we saw a lot more of these because uh, the pandemic forced us to change a lot of our election procedures. We had a lot more voters um, voting early, for example. Uh, and this is great to have early voting, but in elections like primaries, where a, in, like presidential primaries, where the field can be uh, so chaotic and with candidates dropping out, this often means an early voter may cast a ballot for a candidate who is not in the race anymore by the time election day comes around. In 2020 Democratic primaries, this happened to more than 8% of voters. It was a huge number of ballots. We sometimes call them uh, votes for zombie candidates. So what about in ranked choice states? The four ranked choice voting states are Alaska, Wyoming, Kansas, and Hawaii. And so in those states, we also saw a lot of voters marking their first choice as someone who was no longer in the race. Um, and these were states that voted into April. So a lot of the Democrats had already dropped out at that point. We still saw, saw voters supporting that candidate, but what does it mean in ranked choice? It means it's not a wasted vote because you got the chance to mark a second choice and a third choice on your ballot. And so when we look at the uh, how ballots ended up counting in these RCV races for presidential primaries, 98% of voters ranked at least one of the finalist candidates on their ballot. So their ballots counted in that final round. And that is a far cry from the number of ballots that didn't get counted in all of the non-RCV states. So what this all means, coming together, my final little, little box here on this slide, in the RCV states, wasted votes were zero. I said 98% of people had their ballots counted in the final round. So you might ask, well, what about those other 2%? Why weren't those wasted? Well, those voters had the option to rank those candidates and they chose not to. Remember, ranking is always optional. And so the, the finalist candidates in, in all four of these states were the same. They were Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. These were the delegate earning candidates. And if a voter wanted to mark only their first choice and they do not, did not want their vote to count for either of those candidates, that's fine. They had the option to do so and they chose not to express a preference between those two. So it's, it's amazing to see presidential primaries in a crowded field where there are a lot of differing opinions with no wasted votes in these four states. Uh, and so at Fair Vote, we are really looking forward to expanding ranked choice in presidential primaries. I know it's early to be talking about the next presidential cycle, but bear with me. Now is the time that we wanna start putting this in place so we can have more states do this uh, in almost four years.
Next up, I would love to show you how these ballots were counted, just as another example of how ranked choice works and how it works a little bit differently in presidential primaries. Uh, for any of you who were following the primaries last fall, you might remember that uh, in Democratic primaries, candidates get delegates if they can get over 15% of the vote. If they cross that threshold, then they get some delegates. So let's look at how this works in, uh, in Kansas. So Kansas had uh, only four candidates and uncommitted on their ballot. And these are the first round votes, exactly as Scott showed earlier. In round one, we count just everybody's first choices. And in presidential primaries, we're, we're not looking for that 50% 50, 50 threshold. We don't need that. We just need who is over 15%, which candidates deserve delegates from Kansas. And so far, we have two people that have already crossed that threshold. So no matter what happens, and no matter what happens in the next round, Biden and Sanders have crossed the threshold. They will get some delegates. Great. Let's look at round two. So we have some candidates that are below the threshold. And so these votes should not be wasted. So we will eliminate the last place candidate and transfer those ballots, just like what Scott showed in the previous example. So in this case, that is Gabbard, uh, you can see some of these percentages inching up because those ballots were transferred. Those folks got to uh, express their preference for their first choice, but when it turned out that that person did not cross the threshold, their vote is still in play, voice is still heard. But we still have some candidates. We're going to have to do some more rounds because we still have candidates who have not crossed the threshold. So I'm going to eliminate uncommitted next because they are, they are the last in last place. Now, when those votes transfer, we check again. Has anyone else crossed the threshold yet? We're looking at uh, this third place candidate, Elizabeth Warren. We're seeing if they uh, gathered enough votes to, to cross that threshold. And in this case, no. So we're going to eliminate that candidate as well. And now in this final, this final chart, every candidate who's still remaining is above 15%. These are the numbers we use when determining which candidate gets how many delegates. These numbers better reflect the preferences of the entire electorate, not just the people who had those candidates as first choice. So now the delegate allocation between Biden and Sanders best represents what voters from Kansas are actually preferring. So that's how it works in primaries. Uh, we also, we looked at the data from primaries the same way that we did previously. So I'll highlight a couple of these findings that are really strong. Uh, we were seeing great voter turnout in these compared to their uh, prior presidential primaries. So double turnout in, in a couple of states, triple turnout for Kansas. It's incredible. Uh, we are also seeing over 70% of voters chose to use rankings. And lastly, almost all of the votes counted toward the final delegate count. 98% of ballots had ranked either of the two finalists. And so they counted for whichever finalist was ranked higher. Even if you can't have your first choice, you still express a preference among whoever is left. And that's great for voters. That's huge for voter empowerment. So that's all I have to say on primaries, except that uh, stay tuned for, for more from Fair Vote and from our allies as we work to bring ranked choice in presidential primaries to more states ahead of 2024. This will empower voters to cast a meaningful ballot and, and help parties uh, select their best consensus nominee to send forward to the general election. So I will close up my half of the presentation by just pointing out a couple of resources that we have online. I want to make sure that folks know where to find these. Um, so I will show you a couple of web pages and after that, Scott and I will take questions. So if there's anything you haven't asked yet, please do send that along. So as far as web resources, if you want to see this map and learn more about where ranked choice is already used, you can check out our website. We have a nice map graphic there. What you will learn about fair vote is that we love maps uh, and so on this map you can uh, learn more about each of these cities or states that is using ranked choice if you're curious about them another resource is the faq scott and i are going to do our best to get to all of your questions but in case there's anything we missed this web page is up and it has a lot of questions with really detailed answers and so if you feel like uh, you need to go and persuade your friends and family members this could be a good resource to brush up Next up, we are tracking state by state ranked choice voting legislation. Um, most states started their legislative sessions uh, in the first couple of months of the year. 
and there is RCV legislation in more than half of the states so far. And so on this page, we are tracking um, which pieces of legislation have been introduced and what is their status, like whether they have passed committee. Um, we had, so far there has been uh, one that has passed a state house of representatives in Utah. And so we'll be tracking that sort of thing. Lastly, Scott mentioned this and I'm mentioning it again to make sure that everyone sees it. Uh, if you can connect with your local ranked choice voting group uh, to help with the local actions that can help bring it to your city or your state. So we do have another map on our website uh, where you can find the name and contact info for the local RCV organizers in your area. And that's what I have for you today. Uh, I'm going to stop the screen share and then uh, we will get into your questions. Thanks, Deb. So it looks like we have a lot of questions um, and we only have about 15 minutes. So we'll try to do our best to get through uh, a lot of these questions. Um, and if you still have a, a, a few questions, you can feel free to put those in the Q&A. So one of the first questions we have out there, I've been trying to com compile and Emily has been trying to compile uh, a few of the questions into uh, one. So we're seeing some themes out there. One of the questions uh, from Nancy and from, from a, a couple other folks here were uh, major party support. Um, and um, we get a lot of questions about, okay, this is great. I can see why this is great for third parties or whatnot. And do the major parties support this? Um, and uh, I will say before throwing it over to Deb, is um, it just, it depends on, um, one, RCV is good for everybody, including uh, independents, including major parties, including whatever. Because it's not a partisan, doesn't have partisan lens, it's good for the voters. So what is good for the voters and good for the people is, is also, can also be good for the parties. And the president, and as Deb mentioned before, went through the whole system of uh, four uh, states uh, and five states, including Nevada, uh, with their Democratic parties, decided to use ranked choice voting. They proactively said, I'm going to use ranked choice voting for the presidential primaries. So they can see ranked choice voting as a tool to, to fix uh, a problem they have. Um, problem being a lot of candidates running and not being able to get to the to the, to the one best candidate uh, or the consensus candidate like Deb was talking about. And that's why several Democratic parties have ranked choice voting in their state party platforms. Uh, that's why uh, the, the Republican parties uh, in Utah uh, have used ranked choice voting for uh, their conventions. The Republican party in Indiana has used ranked choice voting uh, for some conventions and nominating processes. The, uh, just recently last week, it was uh, announced that the Republican Party in Virginia is going to be using uh, ranked choice voting for some of their uh, statewide uh, nominating, nominating contests. So it's really good for, for parties to try to find out if, the, if a political party has 10, 15, 20 people running in a single race and trying to figure out, you know, um, if we don't use ranked choice voting, we might have a candidate that wins with only 20, 25% of the vote, is that the best candidate that we can put out there into the general election? And so some of the um, political parties are, are coming to the conclusion that um, using ranked choice voting is be would be the better option. Um, Deb, anything to add to that? I think you're right on, Scott. A, a key thing to remember when uh, pitching this to different groups is that different messaging is going to work for different audiences. As, as Scott says, this is good for everyone. It's good for the voters, it's good for the candidates, and it's good for the parties. But if you, as a ranked choice activist, are speaking to grassroots advocates or Democratic incumbent politicians or Republican incumbent politicians, those three groups might all, you might use some different messaging for each of those. And I think, I think Scott did a great job of laying out why this is in the party interest as well as the people's interest. Great. Um, a couple other questions we have here. One, um, there's a few questions about uh, how ring choice voting is used and what are the varieties of ring choice voting. Um, about uh, do, is do they use a different type of 
ranked choice voting in Maine versus the type of ranked choice voting in, in Alaska that they just uh, passed. So I don't know, Deb, if you want to talk about, because you've talked a little bit about uh, how ranked choice voting just was used in the presidential primary process uh, uh, for the Democratic Party to get up to that 15% threshold. But you can use ranked choice voting uh, in a variety of different ways, uh, whether it's uh, eliminating a primary or eliminating a runoff or uh, all sorts of different ways. So Deb, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the different ways maybe Maine's using it versus some other places uh, have used it? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. And there are a lot of different varieties of ranked choice voting that are out there. Uh, in our opinion, we love seeing that individual cities or states have ways to make this policy work best with their own local politics. And so in Maine, they use ranked choice voting for party primaries and also for general elections. And that's that's different than in Alaska, where they will be eliminating party primaries. And so they will be uh, having a nonpartisan primary where candidates of different parties all run together in a primary. And then the top four candidates advance to the general election and use ranked choice in that general election. And these are, they're different varieties of ranked choice voting. Uh, and so we support the local activists finding the system that's going to work best based on the politics in their own city or state. Uh, we also, I, I saw a question in the chat about uh, how to use ranked choice when you're electing three city councilors, someone in Wisconsin asked this question, and there is a version of ranked choice voting for that as well. Uh, it's a version that's used in just a handful of US cities so far, um, but we are looking to expand it. Uh, and there will be a future webinar on that topic. Um, our piece of legislation about that is called the Fair Representation Act to do that for US Congress. So you can look that up and take a look at how this could be used for multi-winner, and then definitely come back for the future webinar on that topic. And we'll get more in detail on that. Fantastic. A um, couple other questions I saw in the chat and in the Q&A. Uh, Michael asked a question about, um, have you ever taken these trends into account that women are running more in, in first past the post communities as well? And the, the trend is up that women are, are running uh, and, and, and winning. Um, and how does that compare with, with ranked choice voting and, and whatnot? So, I would just, before throwing it over to Deb, see if Deb has additional answers to this, because um, what would be great is um, about a question uh, about women running in, in a ranked choice voting election for just the guy to answer that. But um, it, I would say Represent Women is, is, is a really good resource as an organization uh, you all should be reaching out to. Um, and Represent Women really talks about um, the fact that you can have uh, all of these women running, more women running, the, uh, more activism from from women running for their local offices to the to 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 Congress to to president, and uh, but one of some of the barriers that are in there are the actual voting systems. We still have ninety percent incumbency, ninety percent of incumbents usually win elections, and um, you know with without a change to our system, uh, you can have women running all, like a lot more women running without ranked choice voting, without a change to the system, um, uh, it's, it's, it becomes harder and harder for them to, to actually win. And I'll also say that um, with ranked choice voting, we talked about a little bit earlier, um, you, you don't have to limit your choices. So you don't have to split the vote. If two, three, four, five women are, are running in a race, and there's um, you know one man running in the race. You're worried about the 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 the, the, the vote from, from those women splitting among the four or five candidates. With ranked choice voting, what we've seen, um, like Deb kind of showed a little bit of in ranked choice voting elections, they elect more women, elect more people of color, elect more women of color. So I think um, with the added uh, um, you know more women running, uh, it would be great. And Represent Women does a really good job of, of showing that. And we can put the, their link in the chat uh, of, of it needs to be twinned with uh, structural reforms like ranked choice voting. Um, Deb, do you have uh, additional thoughts on that? 
Sure. Uh, so the question was, how do we identify whether it's ranked choice voting that's leading to all of these women or whether it's just the same trend that we're seeing everywhere? Uh, it's a fantastic question. Um, the, the studies that I have been looking at for this use a, a set of control cities that did not implement ranked choice voting, but are otherwise similar, like demographically similar and a similar size to the RCV cities. And so when, when I talk about the um, ranked choice being associated with more women and more people of color on the ballot or, or being elected, uh, we, are, we are comparing that to other cities. So I'm encouraged, of course, to see this trend of increased diversity across the board. But even so, we can identify that among that larger trend, ranked choice cities are doing even better. Fantastic. And there's a couple other questions out here um, that I'm trying to uh, combine in, into general uh, things that we can talk about. One of the questions I hear from, from Brian Garrett out there is, uh, seems to me that they're targeting municipal elections would be low hanging fruit. Um, is this a uh, fair vote strategy uh, if, of starting from local and expanding to, to county, state, and federal? So I can talk a little bit about um, uh, fair vote strategy a little bit, uh, but I mostly, um, both Deb and I, one of the things that was in both of our uh, presentations was that uh, state-based organization uh, group. So what, what fair vote does is, is we are, you know, Deb and, and others, we have a strong research uh, team that really digs into the, to the, to the numbers and really understands how people are understanding and, and, and using our insurance voting. And we are also looking at, um, like Deb mentioned, there's going to be another webinar on, um, uh, on future webinars on uh, the Fair Representation Act or other multi-member districts or other, uh, other ways, uh, other, other parts of our strategy but really the work on the ground is best done by the people on the ground. So that's why, um, you know, Deb was a part of uh, Voter Choice Massachusetts. Um, and there's a lot of organizations that are out there on the ground that we try to lift up. They're not fair vote organizations, but they are partnered with us in, in coalition with us. So if you want to say, bring ranked choice voting to your city, if you wanna bring ranked choice voting to your county or your state, or try to figure out what's the best strategy in that. The best way is to join up with other people in your city, you'll join up with other people in your state and really try to figure out what's the best way forward. So I would say, get all of you guys, I've seen some questions in there about, hey, I'm from Virginia, how do I get involved in Virginia? Or um, Jeff is from Ohio, fantastic. I'm from Ohio too, Jeff. There's a lot of people from all, all, all across uh, the country here and one of the ways that you can really get uh, involved is to connect with your local community, whether it's Rank the Vote Ohio or Fair Vote Virginia or Fair Vote Washington or any of those groups and really come together and try to build up uh, from, from, from the grassroots up. And here at Fair Vote, our strategy is to help try to support those groups. So we, we do a lot of things to help uh, build up and support those groups for what they're doing. Uh, but uh, we're kind of focused a little bit on the on the national level. Um, Deb, do you want to? Is there anything um, you want to add to that? No, I think you covered it. Thanks. Awesome. Um, so, so we have a couple minutes left. Um, there's a lot of other questions that I make sure. Oh, one question I got from Will um, is a little bit about the Alaska model. Um, uh, questions about, you know, there's some questions in the chat there about how it's interesting and um, uh, would would fair vote advocate for that. Um, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit more, uh, Deb, about uh, what they're doing in Alaska? Uh, I've heard some uh, there's some folks here from Wisconsin and some other places that are, that are pushing some other uh, top four, top five kind of uh, elections. So there's a lot of questions in there about how it would be working in the primaries or what have you. So can you talk a little bit about what's happening in Alaska? Sure. Uh, the primary difference with the Alaska method is that they are eliminating the party primaries. And that's a thing that I think was very popular among the electorate in Alaska. I mean, they voted for this ballot question. Um, 
but there are also other states or other cities where the voters are less interested in eliminating party primaries. And so the choice about which method to pursue, I think really depends on your local politics. There are places where people want less to do with the parties, and there are places where people really value party involvement for its uh, ability to get things done at the local level. And so I would say read the room for your state and, and the people, the voters there, as far as which one is a better, a better method for you. Uh, Fair vote is standing firmly behind both of these methods. Thanks, Deb. Um, one other quick question I think we can go, get through. Um, Charles asked one issue I ran into is spoiling of advanced mail by mail ballots. What's the best answer there? And I know uh, we, you talked about it a little bit, Deb, um, on the, your presentation about the presidential primaries. Uh, a lot of folks are, um, especially in, in pandemic, uh, have been moving more towards mail and voting, uh, vote by mail. So you want to talk a little bit by vote by mail, how it would work with ranked choice voting, and possibly there's, um, you had a nice little map you had earlier uh, about some places in the South uh, that, that use ranked choice voting potentially for overseas people. Can you, can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, uh, vote by mail and ranked choice voting are complementary policies. These are policies that really go hand in hand because male voters tend to fill out their ballot way ahead of time and it can be really helpful for those folks to go ahead and mark a second choice and a third choice uh you know scott brought up the use of ranked ballots for military and overseas voters in some southern states specifically those are states who use two round runoff elections so the kind of election where if there is no majority winner on election day in november then everybody goes back to the polls, you know, six weeks later and votes again between the two finalists. Uh, we of course saw that happen uh, for Georgia Senate races and a high profile example this year, but th that system is really hard on voters who are voting from overseas or, or in the military because they vote by mail and they have to get these ballots mailed to these voters and then mailed back to election administrators on a really quick turnaround when a runoff happens. And remember, we don't know before election day whether they will need a runoff. Uh, and so th those states are already using ranked ballots for military and overseas voters. So those voters are already marking their next choice. So if it goes to a runoff, they don't have to go and vote again. They've already said who is their backup choice. And so this is a great opportunity to expand use of ranked choice voting because we see it already working. It, it was put in place there to solve a problem of getting these ballots back and forth and not making people vote twice. And in practice, it has clearly worked out really well. So mail ballots and ranked choice voting are policies that go hand in hand and should definitely be considered together as ways to improve each other. Perfect. Um, just time for, it's the top of the hour, but I think I have time for one more question or one or, one or two more questions. And I, I've been seeing on the chat a little bit and some questions about, uh, this sounds great and all, but what's the downsides or what's the barriers or what's the issues involved here that you're not talking about? And, um, and this also gets to one of Bonnie's questions about the software is from my perspective, I think there's two main barriers to ranchers voting and one we're and we're dealing with both. So one is um, the software issue. Can people, uh, you know, can our voting equipment handle this? And for the most part, uh, for the long history of, of fair votes been around for 27, 28 years. And that's been an issue from time to time, but, but recently it's gotten a lot better. Two things on that. There's a ranchers voting resource center um, that is made up of uh, former elected officials and other experts around ranked choice voting that um, just specifically details and works with other election administration officials and, and uh, clerks uh, across the country on how to implement ranked choice voting, how, how to get the equipment, et cetera. And the second point on that is that um, almost all of the new voting equipments, whether from Dominion, uh, or ESNS or HART or or these other voting equipment systems have ranked choice voting software or ranked choice voting uh, capability. So if a new voting system is coming to your area, it's it's 
for the most likely going to be compatible uh, with using ring choice voting, which is great. Issue is outside of ring choice voting, um, a lot of you guys are voting in uh, on systems that are 20, 30, 40 years old, or uh, sometimes quite old. Um, so they don't have the, the newest equipment yet, quite yet. And second, I say the, 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 the other barrier um, of uh, 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 to putting ring choice voting all over the place is uh, the people just don't know about it. That people don't know about it. People don't uh, understand that, that, that people don't uh, understand that there's another way of voting. And that's why rank it out vote. That's why we are doing these webinars. That's why you out there are so important to talk to your friends and talk to your neighbors and push this, um, uh, it, you know, evangelize uh, for that there's another way to vote and it's better. And, you know, a, a lot of uh, the issues that we have out there, whether it's politicians uh, or uh, groups or any other people, just are, are want the status quo. So any change, whether it's to ring choice voting or anything else, is uh, gets in the way. So uh, we need your support. Um, so go out there and uh, um, evangelize. Uh, Deb, do you have any uh, thoughts on downsides, issues, concerns, barriers uh, to, to ring choice voting? Sure, uh, Scott, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that the equipment problem is getting better with time. Uh, you know, if you, you'll only have that problem if your jurisdiction is using uh, some outdated machines, which are probably due to be updated soon anyway. So time is on our side on that one for sure. Um, and as far as other things holding us back, I think a, a key issue right now is that a lot of voters and a lot of politicians have not yet fully connected this issue to all of our other issues. I mean, everyone here is, we're here because we are engaged in politics and we're interested in how we can make our system better, right? And whatever issues you care about, maybe there, maybe there's some other issue that, that you're advocating for it. And if you feel like our elected officials just aren't being responsive enough to the people on this issue, we really have to go back to how are we choosing the people that we elect and what systems are in place for how candidates and campaigns engage with voters. And right now we are getting a pretty poor grade in that area. And so I, I think we can continue moving this along faster, even though we've already got great momentum with more connecting of this to the other issues that plague us. So when you're talking with someone, when you're talking with your friends and your family and, and they, mention, they mention some other issue, well, you can probably tie this back to, we should be electing our leaders in a different way to make them more responsive to the voters. And so as we continue to make that case, I think this will gain even more momentum. We're looking forward to some really big wins for ranked choice voting over the next few years. Fantastic. I know we're we're a little over time, but I, but there's still there's still questions coming in, so we'll do our best to, to answer a few of them. And um, I will just say one other uh, type of question that we're getting is one from uh, Martin here, who asked, um, "Will this require a constitutional amendment in some states?" There's some other folks out here, it's, uh, 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 folks from from Louisiana, who asked about jungle primaries there being used. So there's 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 some questions I'm seeing here about how to implement it and how to move forward with ranked choice voting in your state or your area. So obviously, um, you know, Deb would know a little bit more about this than I would uh, being, uh, you know, researching some of this stuff, but every state's different. Every state's gonna be a little bit different. Um, some states recently, like uh, for instance, Utah, uh, recently a couple of years ago passed to their state legislature, a local options bill. So before they uh, did that, uh, the cities in Utah couldn't move forward with uh, implementing ranked choice voting. They need the state to pass a, a bill that's, that said, you can do this. Um, so um, they passed that in Utah and a couple, a couple cities have already done it. They're looking to expand more. Uh, in a place like Virginia, a place like Maryland, uh, uh, Fair Vote is based in Tacoma Park, Maryland. The city of Tacoma Park uses ranked choice voting. So cities in, in Maryland can use ranked choice voting, uh, but uh, uh, counties can't. So right now they're trying to go back to the state legislature to do a county uh, uh, local options bill. 
Uh, there are other places in other states in the country where you have a um, option to um, uh, petition and get on the ballot that way. Uh, so that's how uh, Maine got on the ballot uh, was by ballot initiative. That's how Massachusetts got on the ballot by ballot initiative. Um, but um, some states don't have that ballot initiative. Um, and some states, um, you know, it, it, it differs from state to state. My, my rank the vote Ohio person here would know that uh, Ohio and, and some other places like California end up having a lot of things on the constitutional, there, there's a lot of stuff on the constitutional amendments in Ohio. So, um, but it is diff more difficult. So I would just say it differs from, from state to state, uh, whether it's uh, you can do a ballot initiative or you have to go through the state legislature. It differs from state to state, whether you can do a local option already there and some places you can't. Uh, our, our, our partner group down in Texas, uh, RC for Texas, are, uh, is working on three different bills. Uh, one would be a local options bill uh, because the people in Austin, Texas have said, yeah, I wanna do this. So um, there's, so I would check in probably, it's another reason why you should probably check in with your state group um, because they might already know how to do it in their state and what uh, laws they would have to um, uh, look at. Uh, Deb, do you want to add anything to add to that? No, I think you covered it. Uh, there's one question that um, I just saw. We got a question from Barbara, who uh, I, we saw this question already. She actually submitted this ahead of time and has asked again. So I do want to address it. Uh, the question was uh, whether RCV ballots are uh, transparent and easily verified. So this is a question about election security, election integrity. Uh, and the answer is yes, RCV ballots are easily verified. Uh, so we support practices which use a voter verified paper trail and that uh, would be uh, unchanged between our current elections and, and ranked choice. Uh, and of course, we also support um, audits, so post-election audits to verify the results. And uh, audits can be used with ranked choice elections the same way that they can with traditional choose one elections. So for example, San Francisco has been doing post-election audits on ranked choice races uh, for years. Uh, and these were conventional audits. And if you're an audit nerd, then you would also know about risk limiting audits. And I can briefly mention that um, they, those have recently been introduced for ranked choice voting races as well in 2019 and 2020. So the, the techniques for verification that we use in our uh, plurality elections can also be used for ranked choice, no problem. Uh, and then as for transparency, I think that was the other half of the question. Ranked choice voting actually offers an opportunity for even greater transparency of election data. Uh, it's become convention for ranked choice jurisdictions to release what's called a cast vote record. And that's a digital account of how every uh, ballot was marked, uh, anonymized, of course, for privacy. And so this allows for public inspection and outside analysis. Uh, these files are where I get a lot of the data from that I talk about. And so these ranked choice races, when they release this full cast vote record, it provides a greater degree of transparency than, than what we have in our elections now. Uh, perfect. Um, so there's, uh, I think we're getting down to the last of it here. Uh, we, we don't have a ton more time to, to stay on here, but I will say, um, um, one last thing, I, I agree with Deb on that. There's been a lot of questions here about, um, you know, how uh, ranked choice voting would work with other systems and open primaries and all these other things. And, you know, we're not here to necessarily uh, say um, ranked choice, this is the way to use ranked choice voting and this is the only way to use ranked choice voting. Um, we're just saying ranked choice voting is the better way to do it than we are in the way we're doing it right now. Um, so um, if uh, you connect with other people in your community, in your area, who have decided to do multi-member uh, ranked choice voting, like uh, the folks in Albany, California did, um, then that's fantastic. And we'll be there to give you all the support and information that you want. If you're in uh, Wisconsin and, and Catherine Gill's organization, Democracy Found, is pushing top five, final five voting, that's, that's great, we'll, we'll help you there. If you're Alaska and you're doing nonpartisan primaries with an RCV general, great, 
we'll talk to you there. So uh, we'll, we are here to offer you guys information and, and support and connect you guys to the other folks that, um, that want to do that. And we leave it to the whoever's on the ground as uh, knows best about how they want to implement uh, retrace voting. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Dev, do you have Dev, do you have any other part, parting thoughts or uh, 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 questions or anything else before we go? Uh, just that I really appreciate all of the questions that you folks threw at us. It was a lot of fun to engage with you all. So thank you for coming to this. And I really hope that we'll see you again at the, the future webinars. Uh, stay tuned to your email. And uh, we will be putting a recording of this up online in case you showed up late or in case you have some friends who'd like to see it too. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone.